Peter 3, verses 17 to 22. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolises baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clean, clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. I had a Zoom call this week with some of my oldest friends. There were six of us on the call. We're all living in different parts of the country, all of us involved in some form of church leadership. And ordinarily, we would sort of get together as a group several times a year just to spend time together, go for a walk, go out for a meal, just catch up on how each other's doing. But but right now, for obvious reasons, a Zoom call had to do. Now, I've known each of those friends for well over a decade now. Um, we're all different personalities and we're all different situations in life. Some of us are married, some aren't, some have got children, some don't. But what struck me from that call was just how much we are all struggling at the moment. One of my friends put it to the rest of us like this. He said, I'm just feeling the downward drag of this pandemic. All the suffering and all the sadness it has brought with us. And every single person on that Zoom call knew exactly what he meant. Now that that phrase, downward drag, has really stuck with me this week. I think it's such a powerful description of the cumulative effect of the last few months on all of us since last March. So the the daily statistics, the daily government briefings keep coming and it just begins to weigh us down. To the point where we ask the question, can I keep going in the midst of all this? And if you're a follower of Jesus watching this today, that question remains. So can I keep going? Can I keep trusting God for my life and for my future in the face of the downward drag of this suffering world? Now, we've been looking at this letter of 1 Peter in the New Testament as a church family together since last September. And I, for one, am really glad we have been looking at it. You see, the original readers of 1 Peter were people who were familiar with the downward drag of living in a suffering world. If you've been with us over the last few months, you'll know the original readers of 1 Peter, they were Christians scattered across first century Asia Minor, what is now modern day Turkey. And because of their faith in Jesus, they were a marginalized people, regarded with suspicion by the people around them. Now, the hostility they experienced didn't seem to be state-sponsored persecution yet. That would come just a few years later at the hands of the Roman Emperor Nero. It was more a case of just being looked down upon, being mocked, being rejected by the people around them. See, according to Peter in this letter, every Christian can expect to experience evil and insult. Every Christian can expect to experience suffering as we follow Jesus in this world. So Peter's original readers would have known all about the downward drag of suffering and struggle. So I believe Peter's writing the words we're looking at today, 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22, because he knows just how difficult it can be to keep trusting God in the midst of struggle. And he wants to help them. So according to Peter, how can we keep going? How can we keep trusting God in the midst of suffering, sin and evil in our lives and in our world? Well, Peter tells us here, the only way we can do that is by fixing our eyes on Jesus and crying out to him to save us. See, our only hope in this world, in life or in death, is Jesus Christ, the Jesus who suffered for us, The Jesus who has triumphed over suffering and sin. The Jesus who promises to save everyone who trusts 
in him. And we need to remember something as we look at Peter's words here. When Peter says, our only hope is looking to Jesus, Peter knew what he was talking about. Just think back to that moment in the Gospels recorded for us in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus invites Peter to walk on the water with him in the middle of a storm. When Peter saw the wind and the waves surrounding him, he was afraid and he began to sink. The downward drag was just too much for him. But then Peter cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reaches out his hand and catches hold of Peter. I want us to see the passage we're looking at today as Jesus doing for us what he did for Peter that night on the lake. I want us to see this passage as Jesus reaching out his hand and catching hold of us in the midst of suffering and the downward drag of this world. It's as if Peter is urging us here, don't let the wind and the waves and the darkness cause you to sink. Cry out to Jesus, fix your eyes on him and he will keep hold of you until the very end. See, in this passage, Peter has good news for suffering people. So let's Look at our Bibles, chapter 3, verses 18 to 22, for a moment now. And I want to see the first bit of good news comes in verse 18. If we are Christians, whenever we are suffering, we can find strength in an astonishing truth. Jesus also suffered. That's verse 18. Jesus also suffered. On Thursday morning, I woke up still feeling the weight of that Zoom call. I felt the weight and the sadness of my friend's struggles. I felt the weight and the sadness of my own struggles. And it was then that these opening words of verse 18 just reached out and grabbed hold of me. For Christ also suffered, Peter tells us. He knows what it means to suffer and he is with us in our suffering. That's an amazing truth. Jesus, the Son of God, our Lord and Saviour, also suffered. And he is near to his people when we suffer. That is such a precious truth. You just read over the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and you quickly discover Jesus' experience to the full what it feels like to live in a world marred by sin and death and suffering. Jesus knew what it felt like to be hungry and hated, to be exhausted and misunderstood, to be betrayed and abandoned. And again and again, when Jesus came across suffering, he felt compassion for the people suffering. He felt anger at the people perpetrating the suffering. He wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus before raising Lazarus from the dead. Isaiah 53 rightly describes Jesus as a man of suffering and familiar with pain. And Peter says, that is such good news for us. I mean, just think about that for a minute. One of the most painful things about a season of suffering is that so often it isolates us from other people. The voices in our head say, no one else is suffering like I am. No one else understands. No one else can help me right now. Suffering isolates us from other people. But it's in response to those voices in our head, Peter cries out to us in verse 18, Jesus also suffered. Christian, he says, you worship a saviour who knows what it feels like to be you. In spite of how you may feel sometimes, you're never alone in your suffering. Jesus understands you. He isn't aloof from you. He doesn't stand apart from your suffering. No, he knows what it is to suffer. And as a result, he's able to help us whenever we suffer. So Peter urges us, go to Jesus with your suffering. Cry out to him to save you. Ask him to help you. Because he understands, and that is a precious truth for all of us, for Christ also suffered. But as if that's that's enough, Peter goes on to tell us more of why Jesus suffered, what Jesus' suffering achieved. You see, suffering for Jesus was not 
pointless. And suffering is never pointless for Christians. See, Jesus' experience of suffering had a glorious purpose to save us and reconcile us to the God who made us and the God who loves us. Jesus also suffered once for sins, Peter says. He's clear here. Jesus' suffering was a sin offering to God. Jesus took the punishment we deserve for our sins. He took it on himself on the cross and he only had to do it once. Jesus doesn't have to repeat that sacrifice again and again. No, once was enough. It is finished, he cried on the cross. The debt is paid in full. He suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Again, Peter's got the Old Testament in view there. In the Old Testament, if the people of Israel offered a sacrifice, a lamb, for instance, it had to be a lamb without fault or without defect. And then God would accept that sacrifice. So for us, Peter says, Jesus was perfectly righteous. He was without sin, without fault. And as a result, he is an acceptable sacrifice for our sins. At the cross, Jesus showed himself to be who John the Baptist said he was. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. At the cross, Jesus swapped places with us, Peter says. He took on all our unrighteousness, our sin, and then he gave us his righteousness in return. We are now all righteous in God's sight, thanks to Jesus. An amazing swap has taken place. And again, with that truth, the righteous for the unrighteous, again, Peter connects Jesus' suffering with our suffering. See, Jesus didn't deserve to suffer. He was righteous, sinless, the Son of God. So Christian, says Peter, if you ever suffer unfairly, If the suffering you experience feels undeserved, well, draw near to Jesus. He knows all about unjust suffering far more than we ever will. And he's able to help us endure it and to keep trusting in God in the middle of it. And then Peter brings to the climax his description of the cross in verse 18 by going to the very heart of the gospel. Jesus also suffered to bring you to God. Peter reminds us here of what salvation is really all about. A reconciled, loving relationship with the God who has always loved you. See, for Peter, the gospel isn't just about being forgiven or having a fresh start or even getting to heaven when you die, though gloriously it's about all those things. No, at its heart, the gospel is about Jesus bringing us home to the God who loves us. It's about Jesus bringing us back into right relationship with the God of grace. And that is the most precious gift Jesus can give us. He brings us to God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Again, why is that such good news for suffering people? Well, we've already said suffering can isolate us. That's been one of the hardest, most draining aspects of our lives over the last nine, ten months. We're isolated from people and we miss seeing people. We miss talking to people. We miss eating with people. We miss hugging people. But Peter reminds us, no matter how distant we may feel from other people, we are never distant from God. Jesus has brought us near to him and now nothing can separate us from God. God the Father is always near to his people who cry out to him. In Christ, we are as close to Jesus as it is possible to be. God the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. See, Jesus has brought us near to God. And no amount of suffering or struggle can ever change that. And that is good news for suffering people, says Peter. See, by connecting our suffering with Jesus' suffering... Peter wants us to see something that we need to see. Suffering for the Christian is never pointless. Jesus' suffering had a glorious purpose and so does ours. Peter wants to see here, God is committed to doing good things in our lives through our experiences of suffering in this world. I mean, just think about those things. Suffering reminds us that this world is not our home. It makes us long for the return of Jesus and the new creation he will bring with him, free from suffering. 
Suffering reminds us we are needy people. We're not as strong as we think we are. We're not meant to live life on our own. We're meant to live life crying out to God in dependence. And suffering teaches us the only way you're going to get through is crying out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And that is what faith is all about in Scripture. Crying out, Lord, save me. Because the Lord Jesus is the one with the power to save us. And how do we know that? We know that, says Peter, because we look to the resurrection. Jesus has triumphed over suffering and sin, says Peter, and he proved it when he rose from the dead three days after the cross. I mean, look at the end of verse 18 for a minute again here. Not only was Jesus put to death in the body, three days later, Jesus was made alive in the spirit. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again from the dead. Peter knew this because he was there. Peter was one of the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And through Jesus' resurrection, Jesus declared himself to be the risen and ascended king over all evil and over all suffering. And as a result of that, we can know for certain that suffering, sin, even death itself will not have the last word in this world and in our lives. Jesus has defeated them for everyone who trusts in him. And he chooses to share his victory with us. Just an amazing blessing. I always loved the way an old pastor of mine used to summarize the message of the book of Revelation. If you've read the book of Revelation, you'll know it is a confusing, often frightening book to read. And the reason it's confusing and frightening is that actually Revelation, maybe more so than a lot of other bits in the Bible, has such vivid descriptions of the forces of evil that are at work in this world. So we read about terrible dragons, vicious beasts, horrific plagues, pictures of the forces of evil that are beyond our control. But you see, my old pastor, whenever we looked at Revelation, he insisted you could summarize the message of that book in just two words. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. That is the message of the resurrection. Jesus wins. Jesus has triumphed over sin and death. He's taken the very worst our world could throw at him and he's risen victorious three days later. Jesus has destroyed the power of the devil, destroyed the power of sin and death. And Christian, we can take comfort in that. We can find protection and safety in this risen and triumphant King Jesus. We no longer have to fear any of the powers that stand against us. And I think that's what verses 19 to 20 are all about. Now, if you look at those, you may know that these are notoriously difficult verses to understand. They talk about the risen Christ making proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And we all say, huh? I mean, those two short verses are regularly described as the most difficult to understand in the whole New Testament. And the confusion centers around various questions, sort of when did Christ go and make this proclamation? Where did he go? Who are the imprisoned spirits he spoke to? What exactly did he proclaim to them? And I've been reading over commentaries this past week and I've just come to the conclusion we are not going to have all our questions answered about these verses this side of heaven. I mean, even the German reformer Martin Luther, a man who didn't like to sit on the fence about anything, had to acknowledge about these verses, I still do not know for sure what the apostle meant. Well, I'm with Martin on this one. But for what it's worth, I think Peter is referring to the risen Christ ascending into heaven after the resurrection and proclaiming his victory over sin and death. He makes that proclamation of victory to the imprisoned spirits. I take those to be fallen angels. And these fallen angels seem to have played a part in the terrible days of sin and evil in the days of Noah. Sin and evil that God punished by sending the flood described in Genesis chapter 6 to 9. And if I'm right about that, what Peter wants us again to see something precious here. 
Jesus' resurrection proves that sin, death and suffering will not have the last word in our lives. And if that isn't completely clear from verses 19 to 20, well, Peter makes it crystal clear in verse 22. In verse 22, Peter lifts our eyes to Jesus who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. That phrase angels, authorities and powers, well that's shorthand for spiritual forces that stand opposed to God and God's people in this world. And why does Peter describe Jesus like this? Well, he wants us to see in the midst of suffering, In the midst of darkness, Jesus is the king over all creation and he will make sure justice is done in the end. As king, he will not leave evil unpunished so we can always trust him, even in the darkest of times. So Peter knows as he writes this, there are plenty of things in the world more powerful than we are. Just some examples. Corrupt or cruel leaders. Nero for those first readers. Global pandemics like the one we're going through. Temptations to sin, to ignore, reject, resist God in our lives. And in the spiritual realm, standing behind all those forces is the devil and his forces. But you see, Peter wants to encourage us here. Though there are plenty of things in the world more powerful than us, there is nothing in all creation more powerful than Jesus. Again, I'm reminded of that that great line from Doctor Who in the glory days of Matt Smith, when the doctor is being asked by a nervous boy if he's ever fought monsters before. Yes, replies the doctor. Were you scared of them? asks the boy. No, the doctor replies with a smile. They were scared of me. You see, Peter tells us here, when we look at the forces ranged against us, the things that are too big for us, the things that threaten to overwhelm us, all those things, Jesus is king over them. They do not frighten him. They cannot overwhelm him. And he chooses to help everyone who cries out to him so they will not overwhelm us either. Jesus is able to keep us secure in his hands no matter what storms are raging around us. Peter wants to see in verse 22, Jesus, he's the ruler over all. He's the champion who has defeated sin and death and the devil. And as a result, we do not have to be afraid of the dark anymore. And that is good news for suffering, struggling people like us. See, finally, Peter wants to leave his readers in no doubt. Jesus, that that risen king, he promises to save everyone who trusts in him. And his great example of that in verses 20 to 21 is Noah and his family in the days of the flood. Again, when you read over the story of Noah in the book of Genesis, you quickly realise Noah and his family, they would have been looked down upon, mocked, rejected by the people around them. They were very like Peter's original readers. But you see, God saved Noah. God saved Noah and his family from his judgment, just as God will save everyone who trusts in Jesus, says Peter. And the picture Peter uses to encourage his readers of this great truth is the picture of baptism. See, according to Peter here, baptism is a powerful symbol for every Christian of all that Jesus has won for us through his death and resurrection. See, whenever a Christian is baptised, it's as if we're passing through the waters of judgment, like the flood in Noah's day. We are dying to our old way of life and we rise again to a new way of life with Jesus as king. See, just as the ark kept Noah and his family safe from God's judgment on sin, so Jesus keeps us safe and brings us through the judgment we deserve and out the other side to live as God's forgiven, loved people. See, what's Peter doing in these verses? He's telling Christians, remember your baptism. Look back to the day you were baptised. Remember how Jesus saved you from God's judgment. Remember the new life you have now in Christ. Your baptism is a powerful reminder that you now belong to Jesus. So remember it. Take comfort from it. 
live like baptized people in this world. Remember how Jesus reached out and took hold of you and brought you into new life out of the waters of death to be with him forever. I hope we can see here, Peter has good news for suffering people. We began today asking the question, how can we keep going? How can we keep trusting God in the face of the downward drag of suffering and evil and sin? Well, Peter's answer to those questions are, fix your eyes on Jesus, the one who also suffered in this world. Cry out to him to save you and he will reach out his hand and he will hold you fast. Look to Jesus because he also suffered. He understands what it's like. Look to Jesus because he's triumphed over suffering and sin. Suffering sin will not have the last word for followers of Jesus. And Jesus promises to save everyone who trusts in him, just as he saved Noah and his family from the flood. So whenever you feel the downward drag of suffering and sin, whenever it feels like you're about to sink, to be pulled under, Let Peter's words here act like the outstretched hands of Jesus, reaching out to you and taking hold of you. Let me finish again with Peter and Jesus in the middle of the lake during a storm in Matthew 14. But when Peter saw the wind and the waves, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Peter wants us to see here. Jesus is the Son of God. And he will answer everyone who cries out to him to save them. Let's keep doing that. And let's encourage one another to keep doing that in the days to come.